I carried out some work in New York City with a colleague of mine, Kim Noble, um, who's still in New York City. And what we discovered is we took elementary school children and put them in the scanner and had them read words. We were able to, in the group, pull out this characteristic reading circuit, this area of the visual system, which is crucial for analyzing visual words, this area of the left superior temporal gyrus that I was showing you earlier, which is crucial for processing the sounds within language and co-activating them. But what we wanted to discover was, were there differences in how well the children did in phonological awareness tasks, like rhyming tasks, or elision, or pig Latin, their ability to playfully engage with the sound elements of words? Did that predict the development of this reading circuitry in the brain? And it turns out we found a powerful correlation between how well a child did on a standardized test of just playing with the sound elements of language, phonological awareness, and how active their brain reading circuitry was, and the degree to which it approached what you expect in an expert adult reader. This relationship, remarkably, was the strongest in children who were growing up in low-resource neighborhoods, children with low socioeconomic status uh, as reported by their parents and potentially had fewer opportunities to focus their mind on this particular skill and develop that skill as they approached literacy. So we wanted to figure out, could we start to understand this really crucial brain difference of a child's phonological awareness ability and the development of their reading circuitry? So we started to shift some of the work that we were doing in selective attention in the lab, where we wanted to ask the question, could we take advantage of powerful insights from cognitive neuroscience? What in my lifetime are going to be the novel connections that we're able to create across these communities? The most challenging thing is beyond just forming communities that study education questions and communities that uh, study brain development research, and maybe the sliver of people like me kind of in between, that there might be the development of a new interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research uh, set of new scholars that from the very beginning are finding deep, meaningful connections. They're finding, they approach education as a causal force that shapes the developing human mind. And they approach neuroscience as a set of powerful tools that all educators are starting to become familiar with and they can apply to their research. And with those tools and with that sort of combined energy, we could start to, challenge, we could start to tackle problems like this. How many people have read the New York Times on, in April of 2016? We lost the graph, oh. So I encourage you to go back and look at this. So Sean Reardon has done an amazing analysis of state-by-state -state sixth grade reading performance scores. And what he shows in this is truly staggering. If you look at explaining variation in how well children are doing in sixth grade math skills, one of the biggest determining factors, determining what one school district versus another, how well the children are doing on average, seems to vary tremendously by the socioeconomic status, just the education level and income level of the parents of that children, of that child. And within this SES, it seems that there are great inequities in our society and how successful we're scaffolding the development of reading circuitry and mathematics circuitry in the minds of our young children. And to reach sixth grade and be behind by two to three grade levels has a profound impact, um, all else being equal, on the trajectory of that individual into the future. This is something that we need to tackle with great urgency, and I think that we need all hands on deck, neuroscientists, educators, uh, parents, and funders. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.